You don't do anything Andre don't, don't want you to do. Even that big slam that he, when he slammed Hogan, he never told anyone if he was going to do it, if he lets Hogan slam him or not slam him. Hogan didn't even know. <laughs> Hogan didn't know. Oh, Hogan always contends that he didn't know he was going to win until he gets there. And Yeah, he, he didn't know. He told me that. He said, he said the, what happened was he got up there, but he says on the turn, when I had to turn his body over, is where he, hurt his, he pulled his back muscle out. Hmm. Uh, I traveled with Hogan for like two years, two years, because he uh, he was so big at that time. He was on the front page of Sports Illustrated as the most recognizable sports entertainer. That he was he was big back then, and he couldn't go to airports and he couldn't go here. And, and 9 eleven, no, that stuff never happened yet. So they weren't they weren't cracking down so much. So he asked Vince. He told Vince that he wanted me with him everywhere, which I was privileged. But he says to me, "I just want you to know." You're going to get a lot of heat. You're going to get a, have a lot of people mad at you. I, I use these terms, heat. Like people in your audience won't understand. No, no, no. I'll, I'll tell you, everyone's going to, it's, it's, it's specifically a wrestling channel. Everyone will understand, I assure you. Yeah. They said, you're going to get a lot of heat. I said to Hogan, why? He goes, because you're going to be sitting up first class with me. And, they, and, the, and the agent's going to be in the back. <laughs> and uh, you should see Chief J. Strongbow passed me. I'm in first class with Hogan. And he passed it by me. Uh, Mr. Lombardi. You see, Chief, that's how we talk, Chief. He made like, Mr. Lombardi, uh, you're riding a little bit of a gravy train, aren't you? He's like that. And Hogan goes, I told you. <laughs> it, it, it happened. But Hogan was always good to me. He was always a good guy. I have nothing bad to say about Hogan. Nothing bad. No, I, I, I'd never asked for anything bad because I love Hogan. And to be honest, I always thought that he was a really, really good wrestler. A lot of other people say he wasn't, but I, th- I thought he had tons of fire and I didn't say anyone sit down during his matches. So he must have been good. No, you, you know, I had this argument, not this discussion with a lot of people. They say, oh, what, Flair was a better a better wrestler than, than uh, Hulk Hogan. I said, I judge my wrestling by who drew more money. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Not yeah. who did three more flips or who could do this or who could do that. Hogan could draw with a, with a broomstick. He could. He, he went in with Lanny Papa and sold out hmm. as a genius. You know, I couldn't believe that. He was he was my first guest as well, Lanny Poffo, and he talked all about it. And he was he, he was yeah. you know hugely yeah. grateful for him. Yeah, it was a huge opportunity. I'm sure he did it because of Randy, you know, because Randy was up there. And it's another guy I respected tremendously, Randy. Oh yeah, let me tell you something, brother. How are you doing? Yeah. I, I mean, that's the dressing room talk. So that, that promo that you hear is not made up. As um, somebody who uh, worked with Vince McMahon or for Vince McMahon for 32 years, did you ever pick up on any of his strange habits or like peccadillos? Who's that? Uh, Vince McMahon. Pick up on his strange word peccadillos. I don't yeah, know what uh, uh, odd habits like uh, no one was allowed to sneeze around him. No one was allowed to smoke in the entire office building. He hated cigarettes. He was a very clean eater. He, he ate very clean, but he ate a lot. And he trained in the middle of late at night or early, early in the morning. The guy was in the greatest shape I've ever seen a man of his age. He's 75 now. Does he, uh, is he still hitting the gym still? I don't know. I'm not there no more. I'm not there. But they're still, still on good terms. I give residuals for life. Did, did you make more as a wrestler or did you make more as a producer? I probably did better as a producer because they implemented contracts. And if you wrestled on a Hogan card, you get more money than if you wrestled on a somebody low, like a Bret Hart. Or I'm not, I'm not knocking Bret because a lot. But what I'm saying is, Hogan. If you're under the A, we were running three towns a night. You're either on the A, B, or C. If you're on the A, you're going to make a lot more money. If you're on B, you're going to make less money. If you're on C, they throw together a main event, Rick Rude against uh, somebody else. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just like the luck, the luck of the draw. Were you, um, when you were uh, hanging around Hogan for a couple of years, did you find yourself on the A shows more? Yes, all A shows, because I had to be with him. Hmm. So I'm always, you no, know, he, he would wrestle the main event and I would always wrestle the opening match. I know you've answered this a few times, right? Uh, and you didn't even know, you weren't in trouble or anything like that, but you didn't even know you were late for WrestleMania 8 on the main event. I know you've told the story again, but please, uh, hmm. Back in, uh, you know, from the from when you were in gorilla position to I, what happened. I, I, to this day, I don't know what happened. I, here's the thing. I'm, I'm in the WWF. 
I'm in the main event. I know what I have to do. What they're doing is because they, I was so green that they said, don't go until we send you. I'm like, all right. So I'm not even watching the monitors. I'm just waiting for them to say go, and I'm going to run down there and do my thing. Well, the person in charge forgot to tell me to go. And all of a sudden he goes, oh, go, 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 go. Well, I was already late. And so when I got there, I, all I knew was what I was supposed to do. And apparently he had to kick out of the, uh, out of the uh, leg drop or whatever. But I'm not a big Hogan fan anyway. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, but I never heard about it. I never heard one thing about it, not one thing from anybody. And later on, when I would start doing signings and stuff, people would come up and say, hey, what happened? And I'm like, what do you mean what happened? And I had no idea. And I'd say, well, what happened? Well, that's what happened. Then I never was, I never heard about it because it wasn't my fault. And they probably said, why was Godfather, why was Papa Shango late? And the person said, man, I sent him late. Uh, if I was, what well, doesn't matter because he kicked out of it anyway. So, I mean, hey, it is what it is. <laughs> uh, just not my fault. <laughs> that's, not that's, my that's, fault. <laughs> Not your fault. Absolutely not your fault. Uh, just because you mentioned now, it before. If, if I was, if I was, if I had been there longer and knew the system better, I wouldn't have relied on anybody to tell me when to go. And that's where they messed up because I, you know, they should, they should have just said, I, you know, at this part go. That way, I could have just took our running. But, Did you? Uh, I take it you didn't do like a uh, earlier in the day, just like do a test to see how far the ring was no, from the. They didn't know. Nope. They didn't do stuff like that back then. Yeah. Uh, because you just mentioned it before, and I was actually going to ask later, uh, you said you weren't a fan of Hulk Hogan. Was this like always, or was this in light of recent comments? Um, I'm just going to say this. I'm just going to say, um, <laughs> uh, my mom always says, if you don't got something good to say about somebody, don't say nothing. So, no, I just, people in that position, such as Stone Cold, such as Undertaker, such as The Rock, they're just a lot nicer people. And I'm going to let it go at that. Okay. They're just a lot nicer people. Between refs, is there a bit of rivalry? Like, uh, you know, you're fighting over a certain match that you both want to, you know, let's say you or Tim White are having a bit of a fight over who wants to referee uh, Chris Jericho versus Triple H, let's say. Yeah, that wouldn't, that wouldn't really be a factor. Like, um, the live events, you know, we do the matches equally. Would rightfully so, and there's some guys that would want you to do your, your matches, but um, it was always done by production. So there's a production meeting every TV from for like two hours, and they'll they'll either set the referees up and stuff like that for those matches and and so forth. So I mean, you know, it's never it was like you know it was like you know when you see uh, there's there's times like when sh like Shawn Michaels wrestled Undertaker for the first time, and Charles did an unbelievable job in that match. You'd say as a referee, God, I wish I had that match, you know, because you never knew if it was going to be like it was, you know, I mean, and I sit there and go, wow, I wish I had that match one you know, day in my career. And I'm sure there's other referees going, man, I wish I had Rock and Hogan in 2002, you know, icon against icon. I mean, that was just phenomenal in Toronto Sky Dome. So the reaction and the shove off and the reactions just to all the little stuff, the big push off. And it was just amazing. So since you brought it up, I'm going to mention it because that's something else I had to yeah. bring up is because I, I wrote a book and I've mentioned it all the time. I wrote a book on The Rock um, last right. year and I uh, use every time to plug it and it's in the background as well as you might be able to see. Um, I contend in the book and in real life uh, that anybody who says that wasn't a great match, a, like a five-star match, is missing the entire point of the business. Yeah, the entire point is right because it's not going to be no high-flying coming off the top rope match and stuff like this. This is icon against icon. And there was a lot, of, a lot of expectations for that match. I mean, whether they were going to really hit it. And everything panned out great. I had to take a bump in that match, and it just it worked out great. Um, I mean, Hogan looked great. I mean, for his age, coming down that ramp, and then the way the crowd just reacted to the, you know Hogan, it was phenomenal. I mean, it was just – and here's – like I always said, like Rock, you know, Hogan passed the torch to Rock, you know, in 2002 at the Sky Dome, and then – after that, Rock took the torch and went to Hollywood. <laughs> so, I mean, but it was just, that's fantastic for all the years that we've seen Hogan do. And from Rock came into the business and it went into Hollywood. And look where the Rock's at now. He's one of the 
He's one of the most popular Hollywood stars there is in the world. Uh, so we're still in the match then. When uh, uh, Two questions, actually. One, when did you realize that Rock was going to get booed out of the building? And two, when did you get the goosebumps on your arm when you just knew it was going to be Man, special? As soon as Hogan came out, <laughs> it was like they were just behind Hogan all the way, you know, all the way. And they kind of knew Rock was going off to Hollywood, too, at that point, too, you know. So it was kind of, you know, Canada is such a great fan base and a great lot. Look at all the wrestlers that came out of Canada too. You know, it's just amazing. Um, so, you know, they were, they're, they're pretty smart fans. And, but they, uh, they said, Hey man, we're going with this guy, man, for the last 15, 20 years watching him as a kid, you know, and rightfully so he looked phenomenal coming out great shape for his age. And at that point, and, you know, phenomenal match, man. Yeah. Never forget it. I'm gonna I'm gonna posit something to you then. Um, I've heard like a couple of the Deutsche writers uh, say yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. that Hulk Hogan outworked The Rock and basically made himself look so much better at The Rock's expense. I'm I'm not sure I buy that, but where uh, where do you fall yeah. on that? I'm not buying that. They both made each other look great. I mean, it was just it was phenomenal, man. I mean, Rock had to work a certain way with Hogan. And- Hogan's only got so many moves and so many, you know, things to do. I mean, the way they they put everything into the match from start, from entrance to finish was great. I mean, it should have been the last match of the night, but it wasn't, unfortunately. No. Unfortunately for you, you would have got the better payoff as well, maybe. Yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) That's the truth. Good point there. How did you, and you're going to have to tell me the whole story, but how did you managed to convince Hulk Hogan, who was at the peak of his powers in 90, was it 1997, to come down and take the fall in uh, in your retirement match in Montreal? Well, you know, to, to be honest with you, it's a, uh, there's the world, I think that must be the eighth wonder of the world. I don't know myself, but to be <laughs> honest with you, time, timing is all there. I know that the, if I was going to give you the short version, WCW was uh, was growing tremendously, and uh, and they weren't in Quebec, so I had the the uh, contacts to create and cr- a, a relationship with a TV station in Canada and Quebec for WCW to make their intro, and uh, it was not long. Uh, well, it's, it was about ten years maybe after the Bulldog incident, and. and, and you know, don't like me saying this but i say it anyway because i i honestly feel it i never was told by hulk but i was told by other people around him but hulk did not like the way the bulldogs were were, were giving the image of the wwf showing up at five in the morning coming out of the bars drunk and oh, fuck that, fuck that, and talking like that obnoxiously in an airport where they're kids and everybody and and hulk was always the guy who's gave autographs and always trying to keep the reputation and tried to do what he could for the business. So I think there was a dislike there between the Bulldogs and Hulk. And, and, and when I did my comeback on Dynamite and I stopped the bullying for a while in the WWF, I think Hulk grew respect for me. And, and, and because he thought it, what I'd heard is he thought it took a lot of balls to do what I did. And, uh, and a lot of guys would have liked to have done it, but they never did. So, so Hulk took a, lot, a big liking into me then personally. And when I opened the doors for WCW in Montreal, and, and, and I think also, this is all I think, okay? So maybe one day you'll have a good podcast. You could have one with, uh, what was his name? The guy that was running WCW. Eric Bischoff. Uh, Eric Bischoff. You know, we never hit along really good. Not, not, especially not after I beat Hulk in Montreal, but I, also, <laughs> but I think, but I also think that Eric Bischoff had a power trip with Hulk and Hulk is Hulk and, and Hulk wanted to tell Eric Bischoff, I'm up for whoever I want to, when I want to. And I think it was all timing. And I think it was a discord they had between both the liking he had with me. The fact that I booked him with me in Montreal, the great job we did in the promos because we did a promo one month before my show where he slapped the hell out of me on an interview. And I did a promo with him the day when he came to Montreal for the show. He was getting out of the limousine and I slapped the hell out of him when he got out of the airport before the show that night and I broke his tooth. I actually, oh. yeah, I really, I really broke his tooth. Wow. And you could ask anybody. He'll tell you. He'll, the first one will tell you. 
when he got back in the limousine, he called my limousine after we did that montage there, and he called me and he said, "You broke my fucking tooth." You broke my... <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but but uh, but but he had a big big respect for me, and, and I think that, it, like I said, it was timing. A lot of it was timing, and you know, there's something about me that I've. I'm going to tell you something that I've never said to anybody before. You know, there's normal people that are here, and there's autistic and, and, and different kind of people that are there. Normal people are there, autistic are there. I think I'm about here. I'm about, and I've always had a hard time in life, which played for me at a time, but I've always had a, a hard time of differentiating the reality of things sometimes and the the things and sometimes i become in my life and my character and everything i do really intense like i really i get more intense than a normal person i get more than a normal person i think and i cry more than a normal person my feelings are very uh very uh easy to reach and, and because of that and because i when i was growing up my father was my hero and then, then there was half of believing my father was a real hero and a wrestler, you know. But there was a thing in life that I was always convincing in the things that I was doing. Because I was doing it to an extent that it would come from the bottom of my heart and the, the middle of my brain. Everything was so real for me. It looked so real to me. And I think maybe that things happened to me in life because maybe if I believed in it so much, then maybe the people around me does that make any sense? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you wear your heart on your sleeve and you care. And the fact that if if you care about something so much, it radiates through. I, I completely understand. I, I will I will ask one more thing about the match then. Um, I've heard two things uh, for Hulk Hogan to agree to uh, 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 to lose the match. Is one, that he didn't want the bout to be filmed. And two, uh, that he wanted $10,000 extra off the gate. Not uh, true. Not true not at true. all. Not true at all. Hulk was a really professional. I offered him a price. Uh, my lawyer in Montreal fronted me the money. I offered a price. That's the money he got. He was a professional all the way. And 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 your first we your first your first thing that you. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. I, I'm sorry about the internet. We're both having trouble here. Uh, the first thing was that he didn't want the bout the match being filmed, or, or you know him not, losing. That's not true. He never mentioned that to me. We didn't film the event. It wasn't filmed. I mean, I filmed it locally. I got footage of it locally for my own connection. But I was never told that by him. Never. And to be honest with you, I could never figure out the whole time why Hulk was so nice to me. Why Hulk agreed to do that. There's so many things that is going to be a mystery for, for me for the rest of my life. And, and I've met Hulk a few times. I went to his gym. I, I mean, his, his shop in Orlando. And he's got a new restaurant in Tampa now. I'm going to go there and when, as soon as I can. And maybe one day I'll sit with him and I'll have the courage to ask him, why did you do this for me, Hulk? Well, because my, 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 my merchant value after that just went like this. And the heat on my ass went like this because there's so many guys that wanted to beat him, you know, and they always said, no, no. So, so, but I have to know that one day before I die and before he dies, I want to know why he did that for me, you know, why he really did that for me. And WrestleMania 9, uh, it was one of the most distinctive looking shows as far as the venues in Las Vegas. It was outdoors. You had the it Roman theme. It was a great thing. Yes. Can you give me some memories of the day? And also specifically Hulk Hogan worming his way into the WWF title at the end of the night, if uh, if you remember that. Well, um, Gorilla Monsoon, you know that uh, seven city five country tour i told you i was on london yeah uh, germany uh uh edinburgh scotland france uh, gorilla monsoon said oh the golden goose was dead you know hulk hogan's time was over and that was far from true because when we did that five country seven day tour it was sell out wherever we went so the golden goose was yeah, and uh, he's Hogan said, Fonzie, tell Gorilla Monsoon the Golden Goose still lives, Daddy. <laughs> uh, so it was just his popularity that he they put the strap back. You know, it was uh, uh, still 
um, the top of uh, the biggest name in the wrestling business, the biggest name ever. Did you ever ever referee a Hulk Hogan match? Yeah, on that five, uh, yeah, oh, you actually hundreds did hundreds of them, yeah. hundreds of them, and I was a referee when we went on the five. Uh, country seven city tours every day. It was him against Yokozuna, sold out everywhere. And those matches were way easy. All Hulk Hogan was go like this and you know go like that. It was pretty easy, and the people loved it. People loved it. So yeah, Hulk Hogan is a cool cat. He's still a friend of mine. We were both born August 11th. He's a few years older than me, and he lives right here in Tampa. Bay. He's uh 25 minutes from my house, so I see him frequently at the airport or he invites me over for lunch or something once in a while. Hulk Hogan in 1985, because you went to Hawaii for a bit and then you came back again. Uh, you would wrestle Hulk Hogan in 1985, but actually just before that, why were you not on the first WrestleMania card? Because you were in the territory. George Scott. <laughs> ah. <laughs> George Scott. George Scott was booking. George Scott was booking the territory at the time. He had, uh, I thought we were great friends. I, you know, he was, he was a friend of Wahoo McDaniels. And I met him in AWA, and he had been uh, he and Wahoo were close friends, and, and he had, but he went to uh, Charlotte, uh, Mid Atlantic, wrestling, and he uh, became the booker over there, and they did massive, massive success. Blackjack Mulligan, Flair, Steamboat, Wahoo, uh, you know, on and Anderson, you know, all the names, Valentine, the uh, guys I haven't prepared myself for, but you know, great, great number of guys. I, I think um, I think he was upset with me that I didn't call and ask him for a job, um, and I was I was content in Florida, and, I, and then I I always went would go back to Hawaii. I would I would burn out. I'd burn out in, in the in the main mainland United States. I'd have to get back. That's why the, the people mentioned me for the NWA title. I said I would have never been. I was never worth a damn for the title because I I couldn't. Uh, I didn't like you know. Like Flair, I couldn't get on the pl get in the plane on Christmas Day and fr fly to Puerto Rico and leave my family. Why, well, you know, I could anybody can, but you know, I, I didn't. Uh, I, you know, the, the travel and getting back to Hawaii and living in the mainland U.S. Uh, did just uh, you know would burn me out. So. Um, I forget what the initial question was. <laughs> I was uh, why you went on the uh, WrestleMania card. Oh yeah, George Scott and and the. Yeah, George Scott kept me off, and they, 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 they um, the word they told me is that they're going to coming out of that, they're going to need somebody to program with Hulk after that, and because I had been established and I was a heel and blah 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 blah, I was the man. And then and if they were, and if Orndorff wasn't going to want to do the job in the um, in the WrestleMania, they they would they would fall back on me to to be to be Roddy's pipe Roddy's a partner. And, and then, and then the second, uh, you know, and second, and secondly, that I was, I had the privilege of coming out of uh, the first time the garden hadn't sold out in about five years. I had the privilege of coming out, coming out of WrestleMania with uh, Hulk Hogan in the garden, which was, you know, you come to half a house at the garden and oh my God, but we built it up to a sellout, you know, but uh, following WrestleMania, it was just, you know, Liberace and Cinder Lauper and, Aretha Franklin singing, you know, God bless America, you know, everything else. Yeah, it was a hell of a thing. And I wasn't on it, no. no we were we backstage, at least, just looking around thinking, damn, I'm missing a, I'm missing a heck of a payoff here. No, no, I, I didn't, didn't happen to go in. Huh? There were so many people would have been, would have been just total confusion trying to find a place to sit, you know, I just, I stayed away. So... So uh, how was working Hulk Hogan? Because I've I've heard Hulk himself say I've got four matches A, B, C, and D. Is he just been yeah. self-deprecating, -de or is he actually a lot? Because I always have the theory that he's actually a lot better than people give him credit for. <laughs> yeah, he is. Sure, he is. Um, you didn't need to do much, you know. It was it was. Uh, I always wanted a night off with him. It, you know, just do that. You get, you get your heat. Do you know, whatever. And then go home, you know, it was, it was, uh, or going to, you know, what you're, you're going to come back with the next big show or, or whatever, you know, it was, he was easy to work with. I always found it easy, safe, although he did split my whole head open with a chair one night, but you know, he, he was, uh, he was safe. He was, you know, basically safe. Uh, and, and, you know, easy to work with. 
plus, plus, the big plus there. You knew the cha-ching. Yeah, you go. <laughs> if a yeah, Madison Square. The main reason, he could have been, he could have been a lousy worker. He could have stunk in the ring. But, you know, <laughs> when when the, the, the old stretcher Rooney came, he was, uh, that was the, that uh, Eye of the Tiger, that, that was, that was just my theme song as well. Boy, I loved it. Yeah. You him, you know, looking at, looking across the ring facing him. You know, I, had a, I had a good payday coming. When, um, well, when you were facing him, let's say Madison Square Garden in a, in a full house, what, in theory, roughly was the payday? If you don't want to say it, you don't have to, but what could you expect on a, on a good full house day? Back, back then, about three grand. But right around three grand. Uh, it, was, it was split up. After a while, and they, and they, they you know, they, they move it around. And, uh, but after a while, they, they, they'd work into like a weekly salary. They, they, they'd work it out where, you know, the main event here, that there. I had a main event with Backlund one time in Washington, D.C., in the middle of a blizzard, snow up to your, you know, up to your roof, just snow everywhere. I think, oh, it's going to be horrible. I went in half a house. I got the same payoff as I did on a sellout, hmm. and I got a return out of it. So, you know, it, it was uh, it was pretty fair, the, you know, as far as I was getting a lot of the other booking, you know, the things were pretty good. But, but working with Hulk was, working with Hulk was a night off. Plus, you know, it was a money in the bank and a night off. It was not a, he didn't do a lot of things. You know, it's not like you're, you know, I watched the, uh, Stan Hansen, you're, you're familiar with him. He was, yeah. uh, you know, and, and it was in Japan. And it was in Japan for Baba. And he was, you know, he was their light. And I watched him with the Giant. And he had a brilliant match with, with Andre in Japan. But boy, did they work hard. You know, they were, if I was working with Andre, I was lucky. I was always a coward. So I would be able to back off and beg and, you know, take bumps and get the hell beat out of me. And it wouldn't be a big deal. But if you're somebody like Stan, you know, where you had, you know, where you're look, looked at as being that tough, rugged guy, then he, and, and they, he showed up against Andre and it was great. And then next week I happened to be watching another match. But I prepped myself for the making waves. I, I saw another match with him and Tommy, uh, British Bulldog, uh, uh, Dynamite. I saw the next week uh 10 12 match with uh, Stan and, and Dynamite. And oh my God, two different. Uh, from the giant, 400 pounds, something pounds, to dynamite, 200, two different matches, two complete, but two brilliant matches. You know, so it's just psychology, you know, the things. And, and uh, I never saw Stan Hansen work in the United States. I saw him work in J Japan a few times. And, you know, you don't take much much account of that. But I, I saw old tapes of him and, uh, you know, he was a tremendous worker. <laughs> but I, I didn't have to do that. You know, I didn't, I could be a coward. I could beg. I got rid of all this beautiful hair of mine after I, I had to stop shaking my hair and begging for mercy, you know, please don't hit me. <laughs> you know, and big off from the, and I, you know, I had hair flowing all over the place and, you know, somebody punched me and my hair would fly and it just emphasis. But once I turned and I, I left the business, the hair was gone, brother. <laughs> How come after your really successful uh, Saturday night's main event with Hulk Hogan you did four months around the entire country. Why were you pretty much shunted into a managerial position straight afterwards? Because you could obviously prove, you know, if, if you weren't helping to draw a, a, a good house, you wouldn't have been doing four months. So you could clearly get it done in the ring and, and bring eyeballs and get people to pay tickets. Well, thank you very much. That's very nice of you to say. However, um there are things that happen in production meetings and things that happen in the cerebral uh, content of Vince McMahon's brain and his minions. And maybe you're in favor one day and not in favor the next. And you've seen them come and go if you've done any look at, um, but thank you for saying that. We did draw big money, but I never was able to convince anybody they came to see me. In other words, um, who knows who came, they came to see, but at least they were fighting over who got credit instead of who took the blame. Hmm. Because a big house has many fathers, a small crowd um, is an orphan. 
absolutely right. Absolutely right. I mean, did you find being a manager a complete demotion, or were you more of the, were you more uh, easygoing in the sense of well, I, I have a role, and here is my role. Did I find being a manager a demotion? Yes. Yes and no. Yeah. I can see where you're saying this is my role, but no, I wasn't ready to leave the ring yet, and I felt I still had a lot more to prove in the ring. And, um, but they want to make me a manager. At least they haven't wished me luck on my future endeavors. Hmm. And that finally came anyway. I don't know if it's just cost cutting measures because in 1992, obviously the company was in uh, rather, I wouldn't say dire straits, but obviously going through a, 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 a tumultuous period of several scandals, not as many people buying tickets. Uh, was it simply a cost cutting measure? Uh, why you left and similarly uh, you seem to uh, I seem to remember that you came back very briefly in 94 uh, what happened sort of maybe in, for both of those uh, events well I I left after being given my future endeavor speech mm -hmm. and then six months later I came back to be the manager of the Beverly Brothers and then that lasted about a year and then I left again and then they needed me to wrestle against um, that really big uh, black fellow uh, Kamala? with the purple, who? Kamala? No, um, he had many gimmicks and that's why I can't remember. Something, Mama something or, I can't remember. No. He, he went as the V man or something V and it was Mabel. anyway. Mabel was, Viscera. Who? Mabel? Mabel, it was Mabel. And he hurt a lot of people in the business, and <laughs> uh, but I braced myself when he, because Yokozuna warned me. He says, when he does that finish at the end, you better brace yourself. So I did, and uh, I got away with it. So how come your 94 run was so comparatively short then? I never asked. You know, you can't, you can't win. I was there eight years in all. That's more than a lot of people get. Mm. That's more than a cup of coffee in the big time. <laughs> With WWE, when you were there, was there any particular uh, storyline or action taken or anything else where you thought that WWE tipped from professional wrestling uh, more than 50% over into sports entertainment, never to go back again? While I was there? Uh, yes, it could or be. Or just any time? It, huh? it could be any time. Uh, but while you were there, what you saw as well, maybe. Well, in '85, when Hogan came out, and uh, it was uh, it was Hogan, Hulk Hogan, and friends on Saturday night or Saturday morning, and Saturday Night Live, and uh, and WrestleMania. I mean, it was still wrestling, but it was definitely blowing up as cartoon. And so I, I saw it. I don't know. Let's see. It, it's always been sports entertainment, but the, the crazy thing is after Vince made the announcement, business just boomed and he had Austin and Rock and all these cartoon characters, but badass characters turned turned way up. You had G.I. Joe come to life. You know, they were storming the beaches, but they were they were actually coming out to the arena and Zambonis and things like that. And it was it, it was when you started playing the guy's music before he would hit the <laughs> ring, you yeah. know, that never happened. I mean, Oh my God, he's coming to the ring. Can we do anything at all? Oh, we don't know what we can do. Oh, wait for him for the comeback. You know? So that was kind of sports entertainment. -y, if you will, that the music hitting the ring. And I think Hulk Hogan coming out and, uh, you know, selling everything pretty much. Yeah. Uh, in the purest in you, uh, when in 1985 you're in the territories, you must have been, you know, watching this. Was the purest in you just going, "Oh my god, it's just so cartoony"? Well, so yeah, actually, because we were thinking, "Oh, this can't last. It it won't last. They're they're killing the business." <laughs> but, but lo and behold, uh, they didn't. You know, and it made guys more money than ever. So again, who's right and who's wrong in that deal? The the object, and I've always heard it never paid attention to it the object of the business is to make as much money as you can and that's not the reason to get into it initially because if it is you'll be highly disappointed and highly hurt so uh but yeah a lot of us 
myself included, went, oh, my God, how can they get by with this? I mean, it's hokey, hokey, hokey. But then then you got to look back. You have to look back on the history of the business. It, there's been so much hokey stuff through the years that um, you asked yourself the same thing. Uh, I'm actually going to give you mine, and, and uh, I'll, I'll see your reaction to it and see if you agree in any way. Is uh, For me, when I was – uh, it would have been 1999, so I would have been 13. It was around the week that Vince Russo left. And all of a sudden, all the backstage segments went from uh, the wrestlers or the performers acknowledging the camera to it basically being filmed like a soap opera and everybody's telling their secrets and everybody's plotting against other people and people are getting attacked. Blah, blah, blah. But they're not acknowledging the camera that's being broadcast to however many million people. That's the one that always got me. Yeah, that that that's kind of hokey too. If you've ever seen uh, the Max Landis short, uh, wrestling isn't wrestling. Check it out. <laughs> because have you ever seen it? I've never even heard of it, no. James? This is the assignment. It only takes like 30 <laughs> minutes. 30 minutes is, is what it is. I know you got a busy schedule too. But Wrestling Isn't Wrestling by Max Landis. You can find it on whatever streaming. I mean, if not, it's on YouTube, that's for sure. Um, but there, there's a part of there where the guy goes, uh, you know, I watch the show. And I know every time you say this, uh, you can double cross me. You're turning your back on me. So it, it's, it's hilarious, but it's so true. Just what you said. Because you're right there, the guy's filming, you got a camera right there, but you're telling me all these intimate secrets that nobody else can hear, but everybody else can hear. And uh, yeah, that could, that could be one of my, I just wasn't watching that closely back then. I was kind of like going, hmm, okay. I'll go straight on to Hulk Hogan then. When was the what first you time? What you going to do? Oh, it's just, see, he'd be, he'd be one. He's number one. I'd love to talk to him. Because I know some people criticize him, but dude, he's Hulk Hogan. He's the man. Mm-hmm. Uh, first time you met him, was he was he just as Hulk Hogan as you hoped he'd be? Yeah, like the first time I met him was at WCW when he was there, and I just shook his hand. Uh, but then when I got to work with him at WrestleMania 20, I mean, I was that was the best. That was that was three months after I had my knee surgery, and I really couldn't. I was moving. I probably wasn't even cleared to do anything. Um, and I just remember when Muhammad Hassan, which is one of the guys that I started training in OVW. Puts me in the camel clutch. Davari's right there screaming in my face. And Hogan's music hit. I mean, that place exploded. So uh, earlier in the day, he walks in and he's got, I think he had a yellow Hulkamania shirt on. And he looks in the mirror. He's got his, you know, big bow on. And he takes it and he just throws it in the corner. And he pulls out a, whichever one he wore, zero, the red one or the tie-dye one. I can't remember. So I, I looked over there and the shirt's in the corner. Show goes up. On by the end of the night, the shirt's still there, so I can go over and steal it. But the story I give is that, like the I don't know if you've ever seen the Mean Joe Green uh, uh, Coca Cola commercial from the '70s, where Mean Joe Green throws the jersey to the kid and he catches it in this big moment. I'm, I'm that's my story. Hulk threw it to me, and I grabbed it, and it was a connection in a moment we had right there. His hair and boa was was, was blowing in the wind, and it was awesome. Uh, did he? Uh, did you ever get to spend some like proper one on one time? Is it all just all business? And how you doing, brother? Yeah, just just in the back, you know. I mean, I, I wasn't gonna say anything anyway. I was scared to death. And what was I gonna say? I don't know. I'd be too nervous just to make dumb small talk with him. <laughs> uh, did you even feel nervous when you did the uh, Hulkamania tour in two thousand nine? I believe. No, that was good. Well, I, I guess yeah. I guess now, now you say I forgot about that. Like I spent some time with him there. I remember there was one day where we were all in the pool, and I mean, he was always really cool. He was, he was, you know, I, I was happy to be there. 1994, uh, you were th- thick and fast into the commentating by this time. And obviously the biggest news of 94 is that Hulk Hogan comes in. What were the big changes that happened? Not just um, not just in the ring with Hulk Hogan being there and you know him bringing his friends over and everything, but what were the big cha- changes backstage as well? Because I know there was uh, co-branding with uh, Disney MGM, uh, catering, all that type of thing. Yeah, um, well, I remember... I mean, I was doing the broadcasting, and I wasn't really involved in much. But I remember when Eric, you know, was saying, hey, we got the Hulk. We're bringing the Hulk in. So Eric was very excited about the Hulk coming in. And I think the Hulk was excited, too, because, again, like everybody else, I mean, the Hulk was the right guy at the right time for his era, you know, the early, mid-'80s and on, which became the era of the characters. There wasn't a Bruno San Martino or a Luthez or a Larry Zabisco or a Vern Gagne. It was 
the Hulk, the Macho Man, the Hot Rod, the Big This, you know, the Superfly. Everybody was a character instead of like a person. <laughs> and Hulk, you know, he got over and uh, for a big guy, he could move good. And he was smart, knew how to talk and get over with the crowd. And even by 94, you got a guy that's been around, you know, and used and wrestled a bunch of guys. And so for him to keep himself fresh, for him to come from the WWE to the WCW was good for him too. And they had parades for him in Disney and Eric was very excited about bringing them in. And he did good, but, but you could tell that and that's why he joined the New World Order instead of fighting the New World Order was because he wasn't getting over like he used to be. You know, and he was over. People loved the Hulk, but he wasn't what he used to be, you know, 12, 13 years ago, which nobody is. I mean, Bruno staying hot for 18 years was like incredibly unheard of. But, you know, to stay on top for 10, 15 years, 20 years is rare. You know, I mean, Steve Austin, you know, did it and some other guys did it. And then Hulk did it, too. But uh, but that's why he switched to the NWO, because and, and that really gave him a lot more heat, too. And, you know, so he was smart enough to know how to, to do things and keep himself hot. What do you think he was missing? Well, it wasn't that he was missing anything. It's just the programming. I mean, you might have your favorite show. Let's say you watch Seinfeld. And I've been, you watch it for 10 years and you've seen every episode 50 times and you go, God, I love this show. This is great. Isn't there another show on now? I mean, because you, you love it and they love the Hulk, but it's like, okay, anybody new? You know, I mean, because you can only watch the same movie so many times, even though you love it, you want to see another movie after a while, <laughs> you know. So I had to do with the Hulk. It just had to do with time, the hands of time. Kind of erase everybody's, you know, thing. For me, I remember because I'm uh, I'm 34 now, so I started watching wrestling around 93 and saw bits and bobs of WCW, and I just remember thinking how thin Hulk Hogan looked when he came to WCW in 94. I mean, was that any? I mean, comparatively, he was still huge, of course, but he must have dropped like 60 pounds from his like 80s heyday, and I always remember that being making it look like he was a step behind. Yes, I mean, he may have, but again, he was getting older and he's been in the ring for, you know, 12, 13 years. And, and really, he's probably lost a lot of weight because he couldn't work out like he used to work out with the heavy stuff because he was hurt. I mean, the Hulk, God, now the poor guy can hardly walk. He's had eight back surgeries in one year. I mean, probably a lot more than that now. Artificial knees, artificial hips. He was on Raw the other day, took one step and almost fell over. You could see him, you know, dip him. You know, so he was losing weight and he was also getting older and coming along with, again, being seen a lot for years, your body takes a beating. So some of these guys, you know, plus you can't do what you used to do. You know, Ric Flair used to run across the ring and flip upside down in the corner and wind up sitting on the top like Ray Stevens did. But then there came a time when Rick tried to broke his nose, but he was in his 50s still wrestling and couldn't do that stuff anymore. So it Time not only like you know programs you out after a while, but it also your body can't do it, you know. <laughs> so, so um, and this is going to be a very very specific question because I remember seeing an interview with Greg Garner, uh, uh, Garnier, uh, a few years ago, and he claimed during the I'm dying sorry. days of the AWA in uh, <laughs> in uh, 1990 1991, he claimed that uh, him and Vern had a deal with Hulk Hogan to come back for four million a year to restart the AWA. Do you remember hearing anything about that at the time or not? 1991? Yeah, around nine. Well, I, the AWA closed in 19. You know, apparently they may have even tried to relaunch the AWA around 91 and uh, supposedly all but signed the uh, got Hulk to agree for 4 million to come over. Did you hear well, anything about that? I mean, I was there and I, I mean, and I was there because I married Vern's daughter. So, I mean, I was, I, I would have known, and to be honest with you, they, they might have had the idea, but no one, I, I never remember hearing that. And I, I don't know, it could be great just saying stuff, but I really don't remember hearing anything about that. Plus, 
again, in those days, the Hulk was already under contract somewhere else. So you, you could offer him 10 million, but you're under contract, so you can't leave. Hulk Hogan. You actually wrestled. He was one of your first uh, matches in the WWF against Hulk Hogan. Uh, I don't know how much interaction you had with him after he came back and he was WWF champion immediately, but what was he like in 1980 to uh, work with and hang around with? Um, I remember uh, he he always came with uh, Brutus Beefcake. Yeah. Uh, Br- Brutus worked because of Hulk Hogan. <laughs> okay. And just it's just like uh, Dominic Danucci always worked because of Bruno. Wherever Bruno went, Dominic went, and he worked and everything. Um, my first match is, uh, I, guess, I guess, he was working as a heel at the time. And they, of course, I had to go in there as a baby, I guess. And uh, I, I, I can remember us locking up sometimes. He threw a couple punches, this and that. He, he sat me up on the top rope and just came over and gave me a light smack on the face. And uh, he just backed off. And we went into a finish, which I think he just dropped his leg over my throat, which was his finishing move and so forth. And, you know, I, I could see, even though as green as I was, I could see that he was like not sure of himself in there. And back in the dressing room, he actually came up to me. He thanked me and he said, you know, I guess I don't know why I sat you up on that rope and gave you a smack. Now, you know, when you're telling somebody that, you know, you're not you're not exactly sure of yourself in the ring either. You know what I mean? Uh, but um, he had a lot, even though he was, I guess, green, he still had more experience than I did because I guess he was working in Georgia before that, a little bit back and forth. Um, but that was my experience with him, and it, and, it, and I can say to my credit, hey, I worked with Hulk Hogan. <laughs> uh, did, you, um, did you ever speak to him at all when he came back in 80? It was very late 83, but it was 83 December, I think. Um, you know, yeah, you know, he he would always come in to the dressing room. Hey, you know, how you doing, Ron? And you know, we shake hands and so forth. And uh, no, I never, I never, because he was pretty much in his own dressing room. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I did talk to him in in nineteen eighty five, uh, the night of that phantom submission match, or as I call the big upset. And uh, yeah, I I had a little little bit of a lengthy conversation with him. Not not that much, but. Uh, a little bit afterwards, too. I don't remember. Obviously, as a kid, I wouldn't have heard it anyway. But obviously, the 1993 was like rot with scandals, uh, you, you know, stemming from like the last year or two with Tom Cole and Ultimate Warriors started suing them and the federal investigation and everything. Why did that not affect the pop- popularity of the WWF in the UK? Do you know? Because I never remember hearing anything on the news about any of that. Maybe maybe because you never heard that. <laughs> you know, because I, re- I remember that... Um... There was a point. There's actually two times. There was there was that point in the '90s, and then there was another point in the uh, like 2003, I think, where you know w- w- you know it was seriously like I mean it was never like it was going to happen, but I mean I talked to people in the company. It was like you know we're we may end up being this touring European promotion, um, you know, and work a lot more in Europe because the United States was doing so badly at those two points in time. But yeah, the '90, I'd say '92 after Ho- I mean. The thing with, with, with WWF in the United States is, is, you know, when you look back on it historically, they had built everything around Hogan from 84 on. And when Hogan left, which was um, WrestleMania 1982, I think that more than anything else, it's just that lack of Hogan, just the whole thing. I don't want to say collapsed because that's too strong of a word, but it went way down. And I think that's because it was so much star driven by the one star. And I think it's one of the reasons why Vince... Um, you know, number one, he won't make that larger than life superstar. He'll try to make five or six guys or 10 guys or whatever, because even if it's not as big, you know, like John Cena left and the business didn't go to hell. Hulk Hogan left and the business went to hell. So I think it's, that was the learning experience. Uh, well, actually, uh, sort of preempted my next question there. So how, uh, with all the scandals and lawsuits and everything and uh, Geraldo Rivera, and we never got that guy. What was he, the guy with the mustache? Probably. Geraldo Rivera. Thank you. Um, was that the one? You weren't on that one, were you? I didn't do Geraldo Rivera. I was on with Phil Donahue. Phil Donahue. Uh, sorry, yeah, I yeah, yeah. my ignorance yeah. here slightly. Um, yeah, yeah. Which, they, were both, they were both very famous guys in the 90s at the time, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the question I was going to ask is, how much did that actually affect wrestling's popularity in the United States? Because obviously, as I said, it didn't really affect the UK at all. But was it more Hogan leaving or... 
I think it's more Hogan. I think it's more Hogan leaving and the 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 bloom being off the Hogan Rose because when Hogan came back, it didn't go up nearly as much as we thought it would, and and then Hogan left again because it didn't. You know, I mean, it was it things had changed, but I think that, um, I think that all of that, yeah, like I said, like like Hogan had this, um, like he was still popular to wrestling fans, but I think to the public. You know, it was kind of like, oh, you know, the guy who lied about steroids. So it it really hurt his drawing power outside of the hardcore wrestling fans who didn't care. So I think that and in turn, because WWF was built around him, uh, that was, you know, I mean, they felt the brunt of not having that big star because Vince, you know, whatever, whatever the, the deal was for 92. And I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, Vince was talking to me at the time and I remember him calling me and saying, you know, that. Hogan's going to be done at WrestleMania. I was shocked. But then after thinking about it, I wasn't because Hogan had become a lightning rod. And I think Vince felt it was better for him to go away. And I think Vince wanted, I think Vince wanted Hogan. He never told me this. I, my sense was that Vince wanted Hogan to go to that WrestleMania in 92 and retire and be sympathetic and then stay out a year. So people would come back when he came back a year later for the next WrestleMania, everybody would be excited and they would forget about the scandal. That's what I thought Vince wanted. But then Hogan refused to retire on that show and just kind of left. And so it was kind of like this muddled thing. So when he came back, yeah, it was big, but it didn't, you know, the, but when he came back, it wasn't the same Hulk Hogan as far as like people were concerned. Um, and, um, you know, the business for that WrestleMania was still good. But when he started running around at the house shows, you know, with Yokozuna, I mean, it didn't draw well at all. And then, you know, because of that, you know, him and Vince, Vince figured they had to move on from Hogan and go to Brett. And Hogan just decided he'd rather leave than lose to Brett. Yeah, he was, uh, he was in Europe, I think, his last match for the WWF, like nearly 10 years, whatever he was as well. He did the right. European tour he, and he went. He, he, did, he did the European tour and then, he, then, then that was it. Right, right. I think he, I think that it was before, because I mean, I, I think it was, um, I actually think that I first heard from Jimmy Hart um, who had told me, it's like, yeah, he's going to do the European tour and he's gone. And I was thinking, gone? You know what I mean? It's like, it's like I was shocked. And then, you know, in time, it all kind of came out as to why. And it's like, then I understood Hogan wanted to be the top guy and Vince had figured the Hogan day was over and it was time for Brett and Hogan just didn't want to be around. All right, so I'm, I'm going to go on a slight detour. It is Hulk Hogan related, so I'm sorry for boring you on uh, Hulk Hogan, but Greg Garnier gave an interview a few years ago and he claimed, and I've even got the numbers in front of me, and I even read the interview, uh, saw the interview today, so I didn't get it wrong. He claimed in 1991 the AWA was going to restart and that they had lured Hulk Hogan over for $6 million over four years to restart the AWA. Have you ever heard of that rumour, or is that just Greg? Ma I even asked Larry Zabisco, and he's right, it's probably just Greg making th nonsense up. It sounds like just making stuff up, because something that big, if it would have happened at the time... Um... I can't imagine I wouldn't have heard. I can't even imagine because, you know, ever I was, you know, I was I was connected with everybody, and and if anybody, if anybody, if Hogan would have heard the story, I'd have certainly heard. You know, whether it was from Jimmy Hart or from people who talked to Hogan, um, you know, other people who talked to Hogan and other people in WWE and whatever. It's like so I would I would put I would put no credence in that. I mean, I I, I heard of a million different things that Hogan was up to in that period. Um, and, you know, there was always different ideas and people were always throwing stuff at him for sure. You know, these things that, you know, you, you hear about, but they never come through. But that wasn't one of them. It was never there was never one with Vern Gagne and Greg Gagne. That's for sure. Hero Matt Suda, uh, a name synonymous with uh, training um, people's legs to break. And uh, how was he as a trainer after the legs healed? And um, what was sort of the, if you're going to be uh, accepted into training for Florida, how would it generally go? Well, they, you know, they put the guys, you know, through through the through the motions. You know, they had them all. They had Jack, they had Matsuda, and Mike Gray, all the guys, you know, wrestlers, Brian Blair at the time. Uh, Matsuda had a... Um, he was making uh, wrestling gear, uh, wrestling tights, shirts, you know, stuff for for the for the wrestling teams and stuff. And he had uh, four or five Korean ladies who work in the little little warehouse that he had, and they were sewing. But he had a little little gym on the side, had the big mat, big mat on the floor, and then on on on, on the other side he had the uh, you know some weights, some dumbbells, and, 
and, and a bench and some other stand you know, where you were, we'd go and work out sometimes. I don't know if that was the time where he broke Hulk's hold. I was working there with Brian Blair. He and I were working out. I don't know if it was the same day that he, he broke Hulk's ankle or Hulk was ank- asking him about the ankle. He says, how, you know, you just broke, you broke my ankle. He says, well, how did I show you? He said, and I remember here, here telling Hulk, I don't show you. I give you, I take, you know, it's just, you have to learn what I've learned, you know, as, as, uh, as it went down. So he was, uh, you know, he was a salty old guy from old school in Japan. Mm. Is it fair to say he had a bit of a mean streak in him, or was that just the way he was brought up to bring wrestling? Yeah, it was the just, uh, you know, yeah, <laughs> samurai. Yeah. Um, you know, that, 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 that was his Fuji. You know, was, they, all, they all got, all those guys got, you know, they always got that, that killer killer instinct in them, you know. Was it um, was this sort of like an edict from Eddie Graham because he was like the same as Bill Watts and the same as a couple of other people who only wanted tough guys and the really dedicated guys? Would he be the one to say anyone new comes in just murder him? So I don't know. Me guys starting or guys in the business uh, already? Uh, guy starting, guy chancing their arm at trying to be a wrestler. Uh, like maybe fans uh, before the match. Yeah, who would yeah, take on um, Bob maybe. Yeah, they probably went through a you know a kind of a screening process, and had somebody that uh, you know somebody that presented them to Eddie or somebody in the office to to you know to go go on to the, into the training and stuff. So they wanted to make sure that you know who they're whoever they're bringing into the business you know was going to be productive or be you know be a, a good representative. When but then again, he had Bobby Shane and some other guys. Doing you know the 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 gay gay men parts and stuff like you know like that so you know it wasn't you know it's business is business so but you're breaking in your young guys is another <laughs> is another story. Uh, how much did Hero Matsuta charge? Yeah, I don't know. Ah. I don't know. That was that was long before my time. That was uh, well, I, he was training guys. It was there was a whole day at old Huey there. And Harley was even in they. Uh, They'd, they'd take them down to the, the Sportatorium in Tampa, and then they'd uh, and then they'd have them because they had the ring in the back there, in the in back of the, where they do the interviews, and they did the the weekly TV on Wednesdays, and they'd they'd take them in back there, and um, and they had that hero, that Matt at Heroes. So I, I say I don't know if he broke. That's when 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 Brian and I were working out. If that's when he broke Hulk's Hulk's uh, ankle, or was it uh, sometime earlier than that 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 Hulk was. Uh, had shown up. See what they did with Hulk. And when the big mistake is you got a guy six six, three hundred pounds, and doesn't know, you know, and he's a musician, bass player, but he's an athlete. He's not a you know, he's not a, he's not a punk or anything. You know, he just he, he wants to get in wrestling. He thinks he'd be so what they do, they take him and they beat him down, they beat him down. They, they did the same thing with my son. It wasn't there, but you know, they they beat him down, they beat they but eventually if, if you're any type of an athlete, you got any kind of brain at all. You know, you start to learn. You know, you get you get the, you know, what you, what you grabbed last time. You know, I'm not going to give you this time, and everything else. And pretty soon, you've created yourself a six six, three hundred pound monster. You know, <laughs> a guy you know, that can, that can take not you know not that somebody's going to go out there and stretch Jack Briscoe or something like that, but he certainly can take somebody that you know is big and bad and good looking and everything else. And not only that, he can take care of himself too. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they kind of made a mistake. In in, a, in in that aspect, that if they're gonna somebody's gonna turn on them, they better have it's better be somebody good, you know. That's why you know, I religion there uh, allegedly Harley brought the gun, you know, it wasn't uh, <laughs> to, to Kansas City, and rather than you know the, that straight left he used to throw, you know. So, <laughs> uh, were there any? I'll come back to Hulk Hogan in a second, but um, were there any other stars made through that brutal style of uh, bringing people into the business? Oh boy! All those guys that came in in Florida—I don't know who was. Well, Dick Slater. When we talked about Slater earlier, Slater was one. The Mike Graham, Steve Kern, um, <laughs> basically anybody who was down there. They had a guy, Jim Shields, an Oklahoma wrestler that came there. He, he was doing a lot of training. Remember, he'd do a thing where he wouldn't even use the hands, and w- w- you know, just with his legs, he wouldn't let the guy off his mat. And, you know, different guys, you know, they'd have a lot of amateur wrestlers and stuff coming through. I, I don't really, I can't remember offhand if you name some guys that they, I don't, uh, Brian Blair got trained there, came up that way. But he was, uh, 
he was an amateur wrestler and a, and a, and a college football player, at the University of Louisville. So it wasn't like he was, you know, and he spent most all he grew up in Tampa. So I don't know if he'd been accustomed to there, been around those guys all the time, but, you know, and, and some Arndorf, Paul Orndorff is another one, came up that way. And uh, another guy, you know, it'd be careful what you teach him. <laughs> It'll make, you know, turn around, turn around and, and, and end up biting you in the ass in the end, you know. So what, uh, my, he went back, Matsuda, you know, and, uh, and returned the favor. So, you know, the, the things like, you know, guys like that, you know, that, that's, Orndorff was one, hmm. you know, so, yeah. Uh, back to Hulk Hogan, and um, I know it's easy to say now that you saw championship in him, but at the time, you see, I've seen the training uh, footage uh, that they filmed an actual film as well, so it's preserved very well. Uh, very tall, already balding, qu- sort of lanky at the time. Um, and, you know, you're on the road for him, with him for maybe the first couple of months he was in the business before he was sent elsewhere. Did you see championship in him? And um, how's his attitude, I suppose? Well, he was a, I was living in a, I was living in an apartment in North Tampa. I had a, up there, was near Humperdinck and uh, uh, Stan Lane, Hollywood Blondes. It was up there, and uh, he had a girlfriend, his girlfriend's sister was living. And then, then we had the big pool area, you know, Florida, the pool area and stuff. So he was around there with, with uh, Brutus, Beefcake, Eddie Leslie. And he was up in, that's when he was, uh, he was first starting up in Pensacola. For the Fullers up there, and he got his first uh, before he'd gone to and yeah, and he was a big guy then. You know, he looked. Uh, uh, Dusty didn't want him around, so he came. He did went some uh-huh. spot show out around Gainesville, around there when you know it was Okeechobee or some some small high school town. That we and um, you know you could you look at him in the ring, my God, you know that you know if, if he turns any kind of work and. You know, and Vince crafted it to, you know, to fit his style, but yeah, Jesus, six six, blonde hair, built like that. You know, he, he was, yeah, his box office. Yeah, do you remember? Um, he was the Super Destroyer, probably Super Destroyer number seven five eight nine four, because everyone seemed to have that gimmick at one point or another. But uh, he was the Super Destroyer for about a month or two, and then he disappeared. Uh, do you remember anything about the Super Destroyer? Scott Irwin? Is that Scott Irwin? Uh, no, no, Hulk Hogan was Super Destroyer. That's why I was saying he was just everyone seems to be Super Destroyer. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't remember Super Destroyer. No, I remember I was a Scott Irwin when he was Super D. Hmm. He was a, a hell of a guy. 